A very big hack just happened. $180 million was stolen due to the hack of a native bridge. So we wanted to explain exactly how this happened and what the danger is with bridges. We'll be using our 3D models to help illustrate these complex concepts, and they'll often be summarizing what's being said. To jump right in, Alex, can you explain how this $180 million got stolen? Um, okay, so first of all, this is a very capable team. It's a great project. What I want to talk about is basically the risk at the implementation layer, because Nomad is a really nice idea. It's optimistic bridge. It's a native bridge. And also I want to say that I haven't spent a lot of time looking at the code. So it's high level, but how a native bridge works is that you say, I did something on another chain and I transferred some value or whatever. I want to extract similar value on this chain. Let's say Ethereum, prove me wrong. And then there's a time period where somebody else can prove that that you lied. And if you lied, and if that can be proven, then you lose some sort of collateral. And the nice thing about native bridges is that they don't rely on external parties signatures. So if you, on the other hand, do signatures, then you have some external parties that sign off on the fact that something exists in another blockchain while a native bridge would try to prove it themselves. And therefore native bridges are considered to be better than the multi-sig bridges. When you have the native bridge, you have code that implements the consensus and the proof protocol for another blockchain. And if that is correct, then everything is fine. But if it's incorrect, it's a disaster. And the problem is that the code that you implement in a smart contract, first of all, it has to be very efficient, very small because it costs a lot of gas and it's in the isolated world. For example, on Ethereum, you have several clients that are implemented and that diversification is a little bit of a safety net. Or let's say that you want to write a new Ethereum client. You write your client and then you start running your client. Maybe people feel more confident in your client and then a larger part of the network will run your client. As long as they implement something correctly, then it's fine. But if there's one client that has a bug and it has the majority power, then it's a problem. But these things can take years. You write the client and it takes years for it to become the majority client. With the native bridges, it's difficult because you're deploying implementation and that's the only implementation. There's one implementation and it has to be very efficient. So you try to take as many shortcuts as you can and it has to be correct. What you need for native bridges is a way to gradually introduce things and gradually start trusting it. But in the current climate, I would say that the bridges are so important and they're hacked all the time. So and there's something that's marginally better than everyone will jump on it, even if it might require a few years to really gain trust. Can I just summarize just to make sure that I got everything yeah. correctly? So on a very big picture, there's two types of bridges that we're discussing here. And of course, bridges are transferring value from one chain to the other. And the first one you mentioned requires a consensus mechanism in between where let's say you have a hundred people. And if someone comes and says, Hey, I've sent $1 million over here, and then I will get the same $1 million over here. And if people in the middle vote, yes, let's say more than 70%, then the transaction happened. That's one bridge, which is insecure because if it's only 100 people required here, someone can come in and take over the majority and then basically lie that it happened and gets money, which they couldn't do on Ethereum directly where it has hundreds of thousands of nodes. So this new bridge, which Nomad was part of, is called Native Bridge. What you do is you send a million over here and you just tell this smart contract, I did it. So then it will send a million over here after a certain time. During this time, anyone can come and say, hey, he didn't actually do it. And then this guy will have to pay a penalty and his money will not get transferred. And anyone should come and say it because they'll get a big prize if they are correct. So this is thought to be a better process because it doesn't require these nodes in the middle. So you cannot just go get the majority. Anyone can come and submit the proof. So it's supposed to be safer. However, you're saying there's a big downside that this smart contract is just code that was created by this team. And if there's a bug, if someone finds the bug, they can somehow bypass this and saying, hey, I've sent a million dollars without having to even send any proof. And then they just get the million dollars out and no one even gets the time to submit any fraud proof. 
Uh, and you're saying in this case, this hack became popular and then many people came and exploited it and they couldn't fix the thing until $180 million was lost. That's what you're saying. Yeah, so sometimes these hacks are with smart contracts and bugs and stuff like fancy flash loans with involving 14 mm -hmm. contracts and all this kind of stuff. In this case, the hack was so simple because it was this edge case where an empty proof was good enough to prove anything. So it was so easy for people to just copy paste. And that's why they, it came this sort of crazy, okay. everyone was just taking part of the heist. That is a little, little interesting thing about this hack. But I think the primary thing for me is that it takes time. I think native bridges are absolutely interesting. But you have to prove the implementation and use formal methods and things like that to make mm -hmm. sure that things are correct. And actually this hack, it's inside of the optimistic framework where you say, okay, I deploy a bridge. If nobody proves that it's insecure, it's secure. And now it's been proving to be insecure mm. and they will deploy a new version. And then that will be more and more secure over time as people try to hack it. At some point, I think this will work. You're saying that the problem with a native bridge is it's just a line of code being inserted here. And even Bitcoin in the very early beginning had several bugs that had to be fixed. Yes. So pretty much any software will be created and will have bugs that need to be fixed. But with a native bridge where it's taking care of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars, that's very dangerous because these bugs can cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And in this case, it's cost $180 million. And that problem, it's less so with the chain itself because you have tons of nodes. Like in Ethereum case, you have hundreds of thousands of nodes that are running this code. And if one of those nodes has a software that is faulty, that's not a problem because that node just will be ignored. But in case of this smart contract, it is just one. It's all or nothing. That's what you're saying. Uh, so an, an error in the Bitcoin and Ethereum protocol would, in theory, be super serious. But yeah. in the beginning, when Bitcoin was new and a bug in the consensus protocol wasn't that mm. bad because yeah. it was just used by... And low volume. So they could get to, to an agreement and just roll back. But with the native bridges, it's a much harder problem. I get um, it. It's basically an unproven software that comes right into the big leagues and controlling large sums of money and having basically no proven track record. Yes, that's it. It's just really difficult. But mm. what can be done, if you can limit the value locked in a contract like that and just increase it gradual over time, for example, then you could expect that when hacks happen, the value will sort of be limited. So let's quickly also look at how CoinMap is offering a third type of bridge that is neither this native bridge and it's neither this consensus driven bridge. Right. Yeah, so CoinWeb itself doesn't do the bridging at the core layer, but CoinWeb is a computation layer that can run computations based on data that is in the layer one blockchains. It has its own smart contracts. It has reactive smart contracts, which mean that the smart contracts can monitor what is happening at layer one. And then it can move data between the shards. A shard and CoinWeb is something that monitors one blockchain at layer one. So you can move information between the shards. And then it's possible to prove that state between your mobile phone and the CoinWeb layer. In relation to the native bridges, the interesting difference is that the CoinWeb nodes, they run full layer one blockchains so that they will use the implementation that all the validators or miners run for layer one. So the probability that there is a bug in that implementation is quite low. There's always bugs, but by running the same code as the majority or code that has been running for years, the probability that your local installation thinks that something is true, which not true for a network, very low. Can I summarize this again quickly and just bring in a short thing from what we discussed before? What you were saying is right that the problem that these bridges have in general, let's look again at this smart contract. And we're inside of Ethereum here. 
right, is that this smart contract cannot see any of the other chains. They cannot see anything that's happening there. It's like they're blind. So if anything happens on other chains, they depend either on this consensus, so other people telling it what happens over there. So that's weak because you can attack that. Or as we said in Nomad's case, the native bridge, someone can just say this happened over there. And then there's a time frame where anyone can come in and submit the proof that something else happened. But it itself is not capable to see anything that's happened on Bitcoin or Elrond or any other chain. And what you're saying is different over here is that we're running the chain ourselves by running a node. So this one processor node actually sees the real data. So they are not dependent on any external actors to come in and tell it what has happened. They can read it themselves from the actual nodes that they are running. Is that correct? So we depend on the implementation that is run on that Coin Web node, the implementation that we run for Ethereum, for example. We run a node, an Ethereum node, and that node tells us what is the state of Ethereum. And then the difference is that node that implements the Ethereum protocol, that is a su substantial piece of software that has been running for years. And it's big and complex, but it's considered correct by hundreds of thousands of nodes. While when you're creating a native bridge, you're trying to compress that into a few lines of code because it's really expensive to run large systems on the blockchain. It's basically not possible. And so you're just creating a new implementation of it. And it's just a difficult problem. It's not an impossible problem. Absolutely not. It's just that the risk is much, much higher. Sorry, to summarize again, this is one person, let's call it one person or a team or whatever, that has created a software and it's not time proven. So it's quite likely that someone can come and hack this. The software that is running here was not created by CoinWeb. This is exactly the same code that is running by hundreds of thousands of Ethereum nodes and Bitcoin nodes and so on. In Bitcoin's case, it's already over 10 years old. It's already been tested. And therefore, it's very unlikely that you can hack this software up here compared to that smart contract down there. Yes, exactly. Okay, great. Do you want to touch on, because we're eliminating the software risk from the native bridge, we're also eliminating the consensus from the consensus-driven bridges? Is that correct? Yes. So the way that CoinWeb works is that we put all the blockchains that need to communicate in a network. The communication paths of the network are fixed or they change very slowly. The CoinWeb system is fully deterministic, which means that there is no consensus involved when computing this fusion data, that everything that's at layer two is deterministic. But between layer two and layer one, when releasing funds from a bridge, there is some sort of mechanism that needs to be implemented that CoinWeb doesn't provide in the core system. And all of the existing techniques can be used. So can we run through that quickly? If Nomad would have been implemented using CoinWeb, this bug could not have happened because it wouldn't require any external proofs. So the bug that happened with them is that in the software, it has some kind of opening where people can come and submit this fraud proof. And if there's nothing in it, then somehow it bypasses the proof and then it just sends out money. This wouldn't have happened on CoinWeb because it doesn't require to get any external proof. It just looks it up in the node that is being run directly. Yes, I would say the issue that happened in Nomad could also happen in a system built on CoinWeb, but it could not happen at layer two. So at layer two in CoinWeb, you would not have this issue. But you want to bridge layer one tokens and at layer one, it could happen. But what you want to accomplish by using a layer two where you can keep collateral is that you would try to minimize the amount of value that's held in the bridge contract in layer one so that the effect of a hack would be smaller. I get it. So the hack was so big because all the money was held in that contract on Ethereum directly. So when there was a hack, everyone could come and all the money got stolen. If you want to implement the native bridge and want to get that code correct, either it's correct or it's incorrect. But it's important whether $200 million is stolen or $10,000 is stolen. That matters. 
So if you can have a bridge constructed where the amount of collateral that is held is mostly focused on layer two, like you, you have a lot of value held at layer two, but you try to not have so much inside of the contract in layer one, then that improves the system because layer two okay. is much, you much simpler to have layer two correct than layer one. Let's say we create a token at layer two and we put a bunch of tokens into a smart contract at layer two. And then when they're put into that smart contract, they are minted at layer one. Layer two can also monitor the transactions at layer one and decide whether layer one is fraudulent or not. And let's say that bridge is then hacked. So now there is a bunch of tokens minted at layer one and layer two will then know that layer one is broken. But when you have reactive smart contracts, you can still have the property that everyone that holds non-fake token. So if you just held the token at layer one in your wallet, layer two will be able to know that those tokens that you hold were valid when you got them into your wallet and they're still valid. So it would be easy for the contract to allow burning of those tokens to redeem them into layer two so that you get them back into layer two with no loss. The reason why it would work is that you issue your token at layer two and layer two can see and correctly evaluate the state on all blockchains and therefore it will always be correct. And then we invert it so that we say that layer one is untrusted, but if you hold a token and you got the token when the bridge was not hacked, you're guaranteed to be able to redeem it into layer two. So in this example that I explain now, it's layer two native tokens. It doesn't solve the problem of the existing tokens, but yeah. it can create a system where if you create layer two token and you can then bridge it down to multiple chains in a very secure manner. So basically you're saying one option is, let's forget about Nomad. You're just creating a new bridge and now you have the option to do an optimistic native bridge on layer one or a multi-sig bridge on layer one. Or your third option is to create tokens on layer two where they are secure from a lot of these issues and then bridge them down into multiple chains. And if there is a hack happening on any layer one chain, you can burn all of these things and then uh, still keep it safely in layer two. Yeah, then they, they can bridge it down again into a new con contract. Because one more thing that I think I'm starting to understand, if we're just taking this nomad bridge, one weakness is that if I want to send a million dollars here or something, I need to put quite a lot of collateral into this contract. Yes. And so there's a lot of money held in this contract. In Nomad's case, it was in the hundreds of millions of dollars that is at risk of being lost if there is a software hack. But if we had the exact same implementation, however, if I send a million here, I don't need to put the million as collateral in the contract here. I'll actually put it up here where we see what's happening with the other chains and we're not dependent on external information, we can also remove that security threat. Yes, if you can somehow put the collateral at layer two, then it becomes much safer because then whatever you do with that collateral will be based on correct information. In order to solve this interoperability issue, we have, there are trade-offs in, in most of these systems. And I think the best solution is to create your tokens at layer two. But the downside of that is what about all the existing tokens? And for the existing tokens, we can use collateral at layer two and we can simplify the bridge design, but we can't fundamentally fix the bridging problem. It is still a very difficult problem. For me, I think this was a very good session. I understand a lot more about the different bridges. I understand what happened with this Nomad bridge. And I have some good ideas how that can be different with a CoinWeb powered bridge. I think we'll definitely have a new video coming up sometime where we just focus on how bridges can be designed through CoinWeb, where we can dig more into that. I think today's call was more about just discussing regular bridges and this particular case with Nomad. I think this was interesting thing to go through and then it's nice that we have a little bit visuals to show because this is a complex area and it's great if more people get into this and maybe think it's interesting
the idea is that we want to create a series of videos where we do go into these cases that are happening around the blockchain industry. We want to just try to help educate people as much as possible on a little bit deeper technological level so people understand what's going on in the space and what are the risks and the opportunities and the developments that are going on. So if you like to understand things a little bit deeper, please subscribe. Let us know if you have any questions in the comments and we'll see you soon.